In this video, I'm going to talk about an, our, our first topic in inferential statistics, which is confidence interval estimates. Uh, and we're also going to talk about sample sizes at the end of the video, uh, or, or minimum required sample sizes uh, at the end of the video. Uh, but this idea of estimates. So we know from our study of descriptive statistics that if you want to gain some, uh, some information about a population of data, you can take a sample from that data and you could calculate some sample statistics. So for example, if I wanted to know uh, on average how many parking tickets uh, a Boston resident gets each year, I could ask 100 people or 200 people and I could just ask them one question, how many tickets have you gotten in the last 12 months? And then I could average them out. All right, and then that's a point estimate. That's a single value, a single statistic from a single sample. We're going to extend on that and talk about a confidence interval estimate. Okay. And so uh, before we get started, just generally, this, this branch of statistics called inferential statistics, there are two main, um, there's two main topics here, and it's using information about data to estimate values that we can't calculate and test hypotheses, hypotheses or claims that are made about a population. All right, one, um, one piece of information that we're gonna need to calculate in the context of this problem are uh, z-scores. Z-scores based on uh, probabilities or areas. So notation-wise, this z sub alpha it denotes the z-score with an area of alpha to the right. Now what that looks like, so let's, let's for example, let's calculate this. Let's calculate z sub 0 0.05. That means the z-score that separates the top 5% of the area, and here I'm using the normal distribution model, and in in this case, it turns out that the z-score that separates the top 5% is 1.645. And you can use Excel to calculate this, or basically any, any value. It doesn't have to be 0.05. It could be anything. So let me bounce over to Excel for a moment. And let's say we know that this is, uh, let's say this is z 0.05, which means this red shaded area here is 0.05. And if we have 5% of the area to the right, that means the other 95% of the area the green area and the red area to the left combine to the other 95%, or we'll say 0.95 between this and this. And so our Excel function for this is the inverse of the normal distribution function. So it's the normal, the normal uh, standard inverse function, we could call it that, so equal norm.s.inv and Excel only works with area to the left. Now the notation, this notation z with the little 0 0.05, that 0 0.05 is area to the right. Excel needs area to the left. So if you know the area to the right is 0 0.05, the area to the left has to be 0 0.95. Right, and there's our 1.64, well, on the previous slide, it's rounded to 1.645. All right, so that's where that number came from. Now, these these z-scores are going to be associated with our confidence interval estimates, and we call them critical values. So for the standard normal distribution, which is the model we're going to be using here, 
And this is a, the reason we're using it is was covered in my previous video on sampling distributions in the central limit theorem. Uh, these critical values are z-scores, separating unlikely values from those that are likely to occur. Okay, so loosely, we could think about them as the um, the z-scores that separate the portion of the graph that corresponds to making a mistake. So if we're if we're estimating something, well, our estimate could be wrong, and there's two ways it could be wrong: it could be an overestimate or an underestimate. So these critical values are going to be um, they're, they're going to be calculated based on what's called the confidence level of our estimate. All right. So when we're making when we're making these confidence interval estimates of population parameters, and it's going to extend beyond just a simple point estimate or a simple uh, single statistic coming from a single sample. And that confidence level is going to be the area in the middle of the normal distribution graph. So again, if, if you're 95% confident in your estimate, then you're 5% that then you're you're saying there's a 5% chance I'm going to be wrong and that 5% chance is split half of it is corresponding to an overestimate and half of it is corresponding to an underestimate all right so this is basically what visually what our confidence interval estimates are going to look like so like i said a point estimate it's a single value coming from a single sample. And two things to remember about point estimates. One, they're almost always wrong. All right, so if I asked if I asked 100 people in Boston, how likely are you, or sorry, um, if I asked 100 people in Boston, how many parking tickets have you gotten in the last 12 months? Maybe I get an average of 2.6. Well, chances are, if I asked every single person in Boston the same question and average it out and probably wouldn't be exactly 2.6, but hopefully it's close. And second, there's no way to know how accurate a point estimate is. So maybe one sample of 100 people gave a result of uh, 2.6 tickets a year and another sample gave an estimate of 2.4 tickets a year. Well, which one is better? Now, there's no way of knowing. There's no way of comparing point estimates. But we'll use the point estimate. That's basically our starting point in this confidence interval estimate. Now, before I move on, let me just let me just talk about this idea of confidence. Confidence is how sure you are in your results. Now, I could say with almost 100% confidence that on average people in Boston get somewhere between 0 and 100 parking tickets per year somewhere between zero and a hundred. Now, I'm, I'm certain that that's a true statement. So my confidence is very, very high. My confidence is a hundred percent, but that interval is so big, zero to a hundred, it's, it's useless, it's not helpful. So the smaller the interval gets, well, what if, it's, what if I say somewhere between zero and 10 tickets a year. Well, I'm still pretty darn confident that that's correct, but not 100%. What if I said somewhere between one and three tickets a year? Well, my confidence goes down because the interval is smaller. So what these, what these confidence interval estimates will look like, whereas a point estimate is a single number, X bar equals 2.6. A confidence interval estimate will look something like this. And this is not connected to any specific example that we're going to do. This is just what a, what a confidence interval estimate will look like. Our estimate of the population mean is somewhere between 23.5 and 26.7. So our, our final answer, our final results um, will look something like this. Now we're going to talk about interval estimates. In, in, in this video, I'm going to talk about estimating the population proportion. And in my next video, I'll talk about estimating the population mean. But the process is going to be very, very similar. All right, so a confidence interval is a range of values. And this is coming from two things. It's coming from the sample data. And it's also coming from the level of confidence. So those two sources 
are what allows us to create these confidence interval estimates. And so it's going to be, like I said, the starting point or the center of the interval is the point estimate. So this is coming from a sample of data. This is one sample statistic, the sample mean or the sample proportion or the sample standard deviation or sample variance, whatever it is that we're estimating. We need some data first. And then that'll be the center of our interval and we'll go plus or minus some margin of error. And that margin of error is coming from the confidence. From the level of confidence. All right, so as our level of confidence goes, um, well, we'll talk about creating these, these intervals a little bit later, but these are the two places that these values are coming from. So the point estimate is going to be like 2.3 plus or minus 0.8, something like, it'll look something like that. So the 2.3 would be the point estimate and the plus or minus would be the margin of error. Now the margin of error is coming from this formula down here, the critical value, which we talked about in previous slides already times the standard error. And I'll talk about the, what the standard error is a little bit later in this video. Now that alpha, that, that alpha subscripts on the crit on, on the Z score earlier, that alpha is called the level of significance uh, of a hypothesis test. Now we'll talk about hypothesis tests later. That's a, another topic altogether. But but this um, there's this relationship between confidence and significance. The confidence is equal to one minus the significance, or the significance is one minus the confidence. Either way, but the confidence plus the significance add up to one. Now the confidence level, like this, this is always given to you. It's given in the problem. In real life, it's not. In real life, it, it's up to you. If you're a statistician, it's up to you to determine an appropriate confidence level in your estimate. So for example, if you're talking about estimating how much of a, a new drug to give patients in a study, you want to be very, very confident that you're not going to give them too much to cause them harm. So your confidence level might, you might want to use 99.9% .9 confidence in estimating how much, you know, of a particular uh, experimental drug to give someone. But if you're the you know, bookstore at a college and you're trying to estimate how many books to order next semester, eh, there's the repercussions of being wrong are not very great there. If you order too many books, you know, big deal. You have extras for the next semester. And um, so the level of confidence, basically it, it's, it has to do with how bad are the repercussions for being wrong. But in the, con in the context of this, a statistics class, it'll always be given to you. So the problems will read something like, you know, estimate this with 90, 5% confidence or estimate this with 98% confidence. So that you'll be given. All right. So let's go back to the margin of error, which is coming from the critical value. That's the Z score. Uh, in this case, it's the Z score. In my next video, I'll talk about another distribution similar to the normal distribution, but slightly different called the T distribution. So it's going to be a, a Z or a T score, a Z score or a T value. But in the context of estimating the population proportion, it's going to be a z-score. So this is a z-score and the standard error of the proportion. And again, this is a result of the sampling distribution uh, discussion in the central limit theorem. The standard error is equal to the sample proportion P times the complement of the sample proportion Q. So if, if P is 0.7, Q would be 0.3. And that's divided by n. And this specific z-score is alpha over 2. Now it has to be alpha over 2, not alpha, because alpha is the significance. And if we look at the normal distribution, alpha is split between the high end and the low end. So this would be an area of alpha over 2. 
This would be an area of alpha over two, so together they give you alpha. So that z-score is going to be alpha over two. All right, so we're almost ready to um, you know, talk about specifically how to make the confidence interval estimate. But before I do so, just the, uh, the standard error, you know, there's gonna be a different standard error if we're calculating the, if we're estimating the mean. So in this video, we're gonna focus on the proportion. And if we're, if we're estimating the mean, well, we're gonna talk about two cases, whether or not we know the population standard deviation, but they have a, a different formula for standard error. Now, in this class, in most statistics classes, all statistics classes, the, the by far the most common levels of confidence that you'll see are 90, 95, and 99%. So, like I said, the confidence and the, and the significance are related. They're complements of each other. So if the confidence is 90% or 0.9, the significance is 0.1. And likewise, 95 and 5, 99 and 1. So these critical values are going to be coming back over and over. So we, we've already seen the critical value for a confidence level of 90%. That's what we did on, the, on a previous slide. So if you have... 90% here, that's 5% here, 5% here, and this is what I did on when I bounced over to Excel and then back to the notes. This is where we came up with the 1.645. So anytime you see the confidence level of 90%, the associated critical value, the z-score, as long as it's a z-score, the associated z-score is 1.645. And the other two common critical values are 1.96 and 2.575. You'll see, you know, occasionally you'll see other levels of confidence that you'll have to figure out the critical value for, for example, 98% you might see. And you'll just do what I did in that, uh, what, what I just showed in Excel. Okay, so, and like I said already, a confidence level is used to determine how large or small our confidence interval estimate should be. For really, really high levels of confidence, you're gonna have a larger interval. Now, the larger interval is good because it's more likely to catch the correct value somewhere in that interval, but it's bad because the larger the interval is, the less specific the results are. So you have this, this, these two competing factors. You want to be right and you want to be specific. Now, once we have our confidence interval estimate, what this means, this, this idea of 95% confidence, what that means, not, that, doesn't, that doesn't actually mean that if we, if we make one confidence interval estimate, that doesn't mean that there is a 95% chance that the population parameter is somewhere in our estimate. What it means is, if I were to repeat this process, I'd be right 95% of the time. So like what this graph down here shows is, let's say this is the number you don't know, but let's say the value of the population proportion is 0.9. All right, so that's the thing that we're usually trying to estimate. But each one of these vertical lines is a confidence interval estimate. So this, this first one looks like it's going somewhere like 87 to 92%. So that's this range. And the value of the population proportion is in that interval. And to be 95% confident means 95% or 19 out of 20 of your estimates will actually contain the correct value, or you'll be wrong 5% of the time. You'll be wrong one out, of 20, one out of 20 estimates for the same thing will be wrong. So each, so what these, what these interval estimates mean, where they come from are samples. So this accounts for the same process being done 20 times. You choose a sample, you calculate the sample proportion. Then you choose a second sample, 
calculate the sample proportion. They're going to probably be different. Then you choose a third sample and calculate that sample proportion. So the, the point estimate is the center of your confidence interval estimate. So for estimating the population proportion, we'll look something like this. The true value is somewhere between the sample proportion minus the margin of error and the sample proportion plus the margin of error. So p hat is the sample proportion and each one of these intervals has a different p hat. So 20 intervals means 20 samples, meaning 20 sample proportions. That's why some are higher, some are lower. This, this sample has a sample proportion that's larger than this sample. Okay, so now let's familiarize, uh, oops, let's familiarize ourselves with the process. So the sample proportion, which I said is p hat, is the best point estimate of the population proportion. But like I mentioned earlier, it's probably not equal to the population proportion. And we don't know if it's better or worse than a previous estimate. So our confidence interval is a range of values that hopefully contains the number that we're looking for. All right, so, and again, this is this, this formula is just the formula that was on a previous slide. Our margin of error is equal to the critical value, which is the z-score, times the standard error of the proportion, which is the square root of p hat times q hat over n. All right, so just notation-wise, it's, it's important that you're, you're familiar with the symbols and what they represent. Uh, population proportion, sample proportion. So this is the this is the thing that we never know the true value of. This one we know. Never know. And this one we calculate. So we, you pull a sample and you calculate the sample proportion. And is, as always, the number of sample values, E is our margin of error, and the Z alpha over two is the critical value. Now, in order to, in order to make a confidence interval estimate, <clears throat> excuse me, we need a few things. The sample, first of all, as always, has to be a simple random sample. You can't use convenience sampling or some other uh, non-random method. And the conditions for the binomial distribution have to be met, meaning there's a fixed number of trials, you know, can't go on forever. The trials are all independent and there's two outcomes, you know, basically yes, no, you know, good, bad, whatever it is. And there's at least five yeses and at least five noes. And what our intervals will look like if those are met, once we make our interval, will look like this. And usually, um, Usually it's given in this form, but all three of these mean the same thing. So um, we could say 0 0.4 to 0 0.6. We could say 0 0.5 plus or minus 0.1, or we could say the interval 0 0.4 to 0 0.6. It's three ways of saying the exact same thing. All right, so here's what, the, here's what a question would look like. Uh, a survey of 865 voters in one state reveals that 408 favor approval of an issue. So basically, 865 people are, were asked a yes-no question, and there were 408 yeses. Construct a 95% confidence interval for the true proportion of all voters in the state who favor favor approval, or basically construct a 95% confidence interval for how many yeses there will, what percentage of people will say yes in the entire state. Um, I'm not going to solve this problem here. I have a separate video for that. So if you click here, where, where it says click here, uh, when you're done this video, you could, uh, 
click on that link in the notes to watch my solution. I, I, I work through this problem start to finish on Excel. Now going back to that earlier slide with the, with the graphs, going back to this slide, um, I want to talk about how to correctly interpret a confidence interval estimate. So let's say, for example, we have, we, we've gone through the process. Now, I know we haven't done that yet in this video, that it's in a separate video, but let's say you, you go through the whole process and you, you create this confidence interval estimate. And it's a 95% confidence interval estimate. It would be incorrect to say the actual value of P is between 0.828 and 0.7872. Or I'm 95% confident that the true value is between those two numbers. The correct interpretation is I'm 95% confident that this is a good estimate. Meaning if I did this process 20 times, there's a 19 out of 20 chance that this one is correct. So it's like, it's basically the, the six, you can think about the level of confidence as being the success rate. So if you select many different samples and construct many different confidence interval estimates, 95% of them would be, would actually contain the correct value. All right, so that's it. That's our, that's my discussion for now on confidence interval estimates. Uh, you definitely want to, you, you might want to pause the video here and watch my video where I actually work through the problem. And then maybe come back to this video because the next topic I want to talk about is determining the minimum sample size required. So like for example, if your sample size is really small relative to the population. So let's say I want to estimate something. Uh, let's go back to the parking ticket example. I want to estimate um, how many parking tickets on average someone gets each year. And my sample is one one hundredth of one percent of the population, or 0.01 percent. That's one out of every ten thousand people. Would you be confident in your results? Do you think your results would be accurate based on such a small relative size? Well, it turns out that the size of the population doesn't matter. The size of the sample is the only thing that matters. So 0.01% 0 .01 of the population, let's say, of the people living in the United States, well, that's 35,000 people. Oh, it's more than 35,000 people. So in that case, yeah, that's a really big sample. 0.01% of the population is a really big sample. So it depends on the sample size. Like the accuracy of your results depend on your sample size, not on the size of the population. And this, the, the minimum sample size, and it's important to know this, the minimum sample size for your results to be accurate, well, they come from how confident you want to be and what is your acceptable margin of error. So we could go to the formula for margin of error. And that's this. This is what we had previously in the notes. Now you could do some algebra here and solve for n. So to get from here, there's a few steps of math to get here. Basically, divide both sides by the z and square both sides to get rid of the square root and multiply and divide. So you can use algebra to solve this equation or just rearrange this equation and solve for n. And once you do that, now we have a formula for n, which is sample size. And this is the minimum sample size required in order to have meaningful results in your confidence interval estimate. And we always round up. So if you, if you calculate this and you get 11.1, .1, that means you need 12 in your sample. So it's important to always round up. And if we don't know, if we don't have any sample data yet, oh, this should say, this should say P hat. If we don't know P hat, if we don't have any sample data, then we use 50-50. 50% yes, 50% no. Uh, but normally we have some, some previous information before doing our estimate. 
All right. And so, for example, companies are interested in knowing the percentage of adults that buy clothes online. Now, if I want to estimate this, estimate this percentage, well, how much data do I need to collect? Well, first, I need to know how confident I want to be. So in this case, 98% confident. And what is my acceptable margin of error? I want no more than three percentage points. So if I, if I know my love, if I know the level of confidence I want, if I know the margin of error that I'm okay with, then we can use that formula on the previous slide to calculate the uh, minimum sample size. And again, I'm not going to do that, do that here. Click here uh, to watch the video where I work through this specific problem that's on this slide. I do it on Excel and I explain it as I go through the problem. And it turns out, and I have, I have the solution here, but I, I work through the problem and explain it on, on that separate video. So it turns out that uh, if you know something, so previously reported data from a recent result, from a recent study, 65% of adults said they buy clothing online. So you want to do your own estimate, but you can use some previous results. So if you know that 65% said, yes, I do. Well, that's the 0.65. That's the P hat. And then the Q hat would be one minus that, the 0.35. If you don't know, if you have no prior information, you, you need to collect more data. And so that's where the, the 0.5 and 0.5 come from. And it turns out you need more people. And we, of course, we round these two numbers up. So we would have 1,373. And so that rounds up 1,509. That rounds up. Okay. So that about does it for this. Uh, please be sure to watch the other two videos that are linked to this set of notes where I work through those problems. And in my next video, I will cover estimating the population mean. This, this one was the proportion, next one will be the mean. All right, that's it for now.